All right, here we are, week nine, Native Peoples of California. Um, so this is an area where I've done a lot of study. I've done some archaeology work uh, down in San Diego, uh, where I got my BA, um, and then some other archaeology work up in the Bay Area with the Ohlone people. Um, I've done lots of research on the Native Americans of California, um, so I'm going to be giving you a lot of maybe um, first-hand data that I've gotten from tribal people up in the Napa Valley um, that basically is, does not fit necessarily with your book. Um, so again, I, I, I'll give you kind of the, the brief overview. I'm not trying to challenge the book in any way, but a lot of times the chapters are, are general. Um, for instance, an example of that is that they talk about how chiefdoms and rank societies were common. Okay, they're common, but if you look at California and the different native groups, we have a spectacular range of native groups. So were there also groups that were egalitarian? Yes, they were. Um, those tend to be, remember, egalitarianism tends to be not as exciting to talk about or write about. Um, many of us, if I, I, I ask my classes all the time, would you go watch a movie about um, people who virtually get along all the time and uh, do not have a ranked system and there's just not a lot of conflict? Is that create a drama for us? No, it doesn't. Does it sell books? No, it doesn't. Um, peaceful people, even though for me, um, are entertaining and interesting, um, many people are more drawn to the drama. All right. So, a little technical delay there. Um, geography and environment. Actually, if you look at the picture off to the my left, actually, um, this is your language groups, and these are the the um, language families up at the top. And you can see the California basically represents all of those groups. Um, uh, in terms of broader breakdowns of of language families, something like twenty three language families in a hundred different languages in California. Um, uh, like your book talks about and like one of the reasons why we probably all live here, uh, the weather and the environment are conducive to many different types of people uh, commingling and interacting in a state that is not that harsh. Remember, you do not have to necessarily prep for winter here. Um, it might snow up in the Sierras, um, but it's, you know, even on a warm day in the Sierras, it's going to be mild. It's not going to be your below, your six degrees below up in the Rockies or something like that. So really when we get into the environment, um, we get into weather, right? We, we have a Mediterranean climate for the most part. Um, the, the map to the right, ultimately, um, you can see kind of the breakdown of what that looks like and the range. Obviously, out in the, the Mojave Desert, it's going to get a little warmer. Um, we even have Death Valley. Um, and then down in Southern California into Baja, we get a little bit more arid, less rain. Um, and again, the Central Valley, by the way, looks very, very different than what it did uh, prior to us in the America, uh, American experience, Manifest Destiny, whatnot, taking that valley over and turning it into agriculture. Um, that Central Valley used to be a lush delta of riverways and waterways, tule elk. Uh, the amount of food that was available in the Central uh, Valley was amazing, natural food, not planted or agriculture. Um, so yeah, I mean, California, is one of the most diverse uh, uh, regions in the world in terms of, of geography and also one of the most diverse regions in terms of Native American language groups as well. Okay, so plants and animals, what do they subsist on? Uh, really, um, the subsistence uh, relied heavily on acorns. Um, acorns were pretty much the main staple. Uh, many people traded for acorns. Um, here in the Tehachapi's, people would would trade different uh, lower level uh, peoples for black acorns and they would trade them deer meat. So when we think of what is value to us, we kind of put uh, meat as higher value, um, but the natives put higher value actually or equal value on acorns. Um, acorns could have been, they would be stored uh, during the, the fall harvest. They would store them in granaries above ground so that the rats and the mice would not get to them and other rodents. Um, and there's a picture later on down the road showing you what those granaries would look like. Um, pine nuts would also uh, have been collected. Um, seeds and grasses, some of the grasses that were native here, miner's lettuce, I don't know if you guys have seen this. When you go out on trails, um, sometimes it's just kind of a roundish little low-lying, um, looks like salad mix really. Um, and this is kind of more in the foothills uh, area as well. Seeds, or sorry, uh, uh, berries, um, 
the black raspberries that you see all over the place in California would have been native, so those would have been part of it. And we have a bunch of different other berries. That elderberries are very, very important um, medicinally and um, in terms of kind of uh, making that syrupy, sweet, sugary um, part of our kind of palate available was, was also um, in certain kind of mountainous uh, uh, foothill areas as well. Tule elk, um, probably mentioned them earlier. Tule elk were all over the place as long and as well as pronghorn antelope. We don't see these a lot anymore. There's still some herds of tule elk here and there, um, but pronghorn antelope basically are extinct. Um, they are not around. They used to be everywhere. Mountain sheep are going to be on the eastern Sierra side. Down in San Diego, they used to hunt the mountain sheep with the hunting blinds, um, and this was a big part of that um, Kumeyaay. Uh, group that was very connected to the Udo Aztec and, and ultimately this is why San Diego State takes on the name of Aztec. There was some relationship there um, with, the, uh, with the Udo Aztecans. Um, rabbits and hares would have been snared and caught. Um, again, a lot of times children and, and women would have, would have been doing the snaring um, and uh, laying the traps for these groups. Insects, grasshoppers. Um, in the movie Ishii, it talks about how um, these poor savages were eating bugs. Remember, bugs are one of the healthiest protein sources we have on the planet. They're just uh, tabooed for us because they're not beef or pork or chicken. Um, bugs are very nutritious. They definitely have the vitamin Bs and the protein content um, and don't take up as much land in terms of water and space and resources. Um, sea mammals and shellfish, so if you were on the coast, like the Coast of Noans or the Chumash all the way down, the Selenians, um, and then all the way up to, to kind of the northwest coast, um, uh, shellfish were a vital piece of, of the um, food resources for the Coast of Noans or the Ohlone's that were in the Bay Area. Um, and again, the, the Ohlone's up there in terms of shell, shellfish, I had the opportunity to excavate a Native American who was buried in a shell midden, which is, which is basically a, a refuse pile of oyster shells. Um, and it wasn't seen as a negative thing to, to bury your relatives in that structure. Um, when shell midden starts to break down, it starts to really kind of solidify and almost turn into a concrete cement. Um, so it's very difficult to, to excavate. It was a very hard excavation to um, get the, the Native American um, remains out of that location. Um, and again, this was right in San Mateo. It would have been on the coast uh, prior to us filling in the, the bay and uh, doing a lot of damage. Remember, the this area, the San Francisco Bay, just had heaps and heaps of, of shell middens um, where basically the natives were just chucking their, their oyster shells um, and they, they lived on the ocean and the food was just there and it was easy catch, right? There's not a whole lot of risk behavior associated with getting, um, minus maybe scraping your hand when you can't get the oyster shell open. Um, but again, this was, this was uh, a vital part of the, the Bay Area and all the way down, up and down the coast. Um, sea mammals, uh, kelp, seaweed, all those things provide vital nutrients. Um, you know, early accounts of, of European explorers uh, coming to California, they, they had some dramatic kind of um, visuals in terms of their descriptions about California uh, native life. Um, there was one, I forget who it was, if it was uh, early English Russian or, or Spanish, but ultimately in the Central Valley, they, they looked up in the air and they could not even see the sky because there were so many birds in the sky. Um, remember, California condors were here, uh, grizzly bears were everywhere. Um, the, 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 amount, the amount of sea life in places like the San Francisco Bay and the Monterey Bay would have been abundant. Um, I tell people that it was almost like food jumping in your lap. And again, the big question here is, well, why didn't California Native Americans have uh, agriculture. They didn't need agriculture. Agriculture requires a bunch of time. Um, it's not some valuable invention that, that cures everything in the world. Um, what it does do is it, it helps us populate and survive. They were not worried about population, right? It requires a higher population to farm. Um, these groups of people, in terms of the acorn, um, you had your carb and then you had your sea life. You're, you're basically set. Um, and then add in insects and some of these other berries and nuts and, and you're good to go. The earth provides, especially California, not super difficult to find food in native uh, California. All right, in terms of the history, 
Um, earliest evidence of occupation is about 12,000 years ago. Um, we have a Clovis period in the Central Valley, so ultimately that is arranged by, um, by face points um, used for hunting larger um, mammals during that Holocene time period. Um, that comes to an end at about 10,000 years ago. And again, during this time period, you would have seen the kind of the woolly uh, mammoths, um, mastodons, uh, giant sloths, saber-toothed tigers, those kinds of things would have been kind of around during that time period if you need a mental picture of what those large mammals look like. They pretty much go extinct at about 10,000 years ago. Um, and it's, it's, it, it looks like it's a combination of, of uh, human hunting along with uh, climate change. Um, again, these are early occupation sites that we have, have proof of. Um, my inclination is that uh, we'll start to see some sites that, that move this back a little bit. Um, and it's because this, this coastal migration theory or kelp road idea is starting to gain some traction and some um, research. Again, sea, level, sea levels have risen in the last 5,000 years, 500 feet. So if people were traveling this kelp road along the ocean um, and stopping on beaches, those would be under the water about 500 feet. Um, so there's, there's, it's really hard to do underwater archaeology, especially on the Pacific coast, because of all the nutrients in the water. Um, but my, again, my inclination always with archaeology and physical anthropology is that we move dates back. We never move them forward. Um, so a lot of times... These things that uh, we hear about on the news tend to, to move dates back, and, and it's kind of more exciting to move dates back than forward um, for us in the field as well. Um, uh, 4,000 years ago, acorns begin to be used. At least this is when we have evidence, um, and this may have been when people figured out how to leach out the, the kind of bitters out of the out of the acorn with water um, and then pass that on to different groups. It wasn't until 1500 years ago that we get the bow and arrow that's introduced. And again, before that, spears, atlatls, um, you know, harpoons, those kinds of things would have been used. But, but bow and arrow, bow and arrow, remember, in terms of a symbolic hunting method, bow and arrow sing signifies a certain individuality um, and uh, status associated with hunting as an individual. Um, prior to this, remember, there were more group hunts where you had people pushing bison off or uh, herding them off a, a, a cliff or net hunting or all these different kinds of group hunting that would have made for more egalitarian society. So we have the bow and arrow at 1500. So what you guys could start to do is start to piece together, well, this, these things kind of make an egalitarian society and then we move away from those and those start to make a ranked society. So we can start to see that. And again, if the bow and arrow is, is one of those symbols, then we can start to kind of guess that we're going to get some more ranked societies out of that. Um, Southern California, 10,000 years ago, we get, also get some occupation sites. Um, I don't know if you guys heard on the news, but uh, a few months back, they found um, a mammoth bone down in San Diego, uh, dated it back to over 100,000 years ago. And, and they, uh, the, the researchers there are saying that there's human um, kind of... Uh, human contact with the, that mammoth bone, aka cut marks and whatnot that, that they say could not have happened in natural um, circumstances. Um, again, this would be a, another version of backing up the date, um, right? And if people did travel to Kelp Road and ultimately make it down to San Diego, they come on shore, they start to hunt mammoths at 100,000 years ago, this is pushing dates back. But we also, um, we have a date pushed back in terms of, of when the first Homo sapiens get into Europe. Um, a long time ago, um, at least the growing going dates were kind of 60,000 years ago, maybe a little bit before that. Now we're kind of going all the way back to almost 200,000 years ago. So if Homo sapiens got out of Africa at 200,000 years ago and started to travel the world, which we tend to do, um, then 100,000 years ago is not totally off base. Now, does the scientific community need to back this up more and, and more data needs to come forward? Absolutely. I'm not here to tell you like, oh, look, at we found this date. This is fact. No, this has to go through the scientific rigor like everything else. Um, more and more archaeologists, if we find more discoveries that, that place that date back, remember this is going to change. If it does happen, this will change the whole makeup of, of Native Americans, when they came, who were their relatives, who was this first group of people with the migration pattern. They may not have bred and had permanent settlements. They may have died off, so they might not even be in the gene pool anymore. There is all kinds of, of hypothesis and theory out there. But remember, it needs to be tested by the field. Um, 
So if you guys want to look up that site, there's a, I think it was on the Highway 58, they found this, this kind of site that has become very, very controversial within the field in terms of the um, Bering Strait land bridge and all of these other kind of um, migration patterns and, and dates.